What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Mop. This is the Elder Scrolls podcast. I'm Scott. I'm here with Michael and Drew, as always. And today we are talking about Azura, the Daedric Prince. That's right. The Daedric Prince, one of Scott's favorite oh. Daedric Princes. So we know he's going to talk all about her today. Who is she, my favorite, bro? One of, I said, not your favorite. I said, least one of the of reclamations, favorite. least of them. But your reclamations are just like sky high anyway. Yeah, but hold on. I think there's others over Azura. So you like Boethia over Azura? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we've covered this. We've huh. covered I thought this. the Boethia was your bottom, but okay. Anyway. Maybe, maybe it changes. The Boethia podcast. Ways, but... <laughs> yeah, we're, we're off. We're off to a good start with Scott saying, "Oh yeah, Azura's okay." <laughs> Not really, my Queen favorite. of Dawn and Dusk, <laughs> Azura it. of the Crimson Gate, the Mother Soul, Moon Shadow, Mother of the Rose, Queen of the Night Sky, the Rim of All Holes. I like Azura. That one. Yes, the God of Fate and Prophecy, mm, which is very important in the Elder Scrolls universe. Mm-hmm. So who's going to take it away first? <laughs> well, I guess one of the coolest things about Azura... Look, we're going to talk all about her history, right? We're going to talk about mm-hmm. everything she's been involved with, especially with the Dunmer of Morrowind and the Kaima. But first up, I'd like to say that she is also not necessarily the most straightforward Daedric Prince. You know, you have princes like Nocturnal that don't want to be understood, but in least, at least in my head... uh, I would say Nocturnal is less um, uh, obscure than Azura, at least to me. I feel like I understand Nocturnal a little bit better. Azura is obviously a Daedric Prince of Vanity and Egotism, which is something that I guess is easier to understand. The fact that she desires to be loved. Well, I don't know how... Yeah, yeah, true. She desires to be loved, and everything about her is is like beauty... Mm. And it is said that she feels pain even when her own followers don't love themselves. It's one of those situations yeah. where if you're a good follower and you show her admiration, then yeah, things tend to go pretty well for you. But if you if you follow her and then you betray her, that's basically the worst thing you can do in her eyes. Is she doesn't like betrayal and she will come down on you like a ton of bricks if you do. So she's well, not the about nicest. This, the- there's a nice quote there just sort of summing up her sort of the way she likes to be worshipped. Like, Molag Bal wanted my mind, Boethia wanted my arms, and Nocturnal, perhaps my curiosity. Azura wants all of that and our love above all. Not our abject slavering, but our honest and genuine caring in all its forms. It is important to her that our emotions be engaged in her worship and our love and our love must also be directed inward if we love her and hate ourselves she feels our pain i will for all time have no other mistress mm. um so it's a little clingy that, you know yeah it's, it's just a it's dang- like that's the thing is it sounds fantastic and and to be honest compared to most daedric princes it is but it seems seems like it could be very easy to wrong her mm. you know Understand. yeah a bit, a bit like a clingy gf mm. Well, we can start talking about like the, the, the biggest, the probably most like famous thing she's known for, which is kind of creating the Dark Elves. So you, so you have the Kaima that worshipped the Reclamations and chief among them was, as, um, sorry, not chief among them, but a very important one was Azura. And Azura was actually like directly credited with making, sorry, like the, well, she did make curse them to make them ashen skin and red eyes and turn them into the Dunmar. Now, this all happened because we have Indoral Nerevar, the Hortator and leader of the Kaima, and she he was sort of seen as a champion of Azura. But when he was betrayed by the tribunal, and of course there are so many varying accounts of this, and we're not going to get derail the video to go too much into that. But look, the story is simply Azura cursed them with ashen skin and red eyes, and set forth a Nerevarine prophecy that one day Indor and Nerevar would return and, you know, restore the balance to the world <laughs> kind of thing. Well, that's the thing. When when the Kaima very, you know, first made the move and became the change, changed ones, it was Azura who showed them how to be different from the Ultima, like how to change their skin. So essentially, she's, she's the reason they turn gold and she's also the reason they turn ashen skin and red eyes. And it's a perfect example of what it what it means to betray her, you know, that... These uh, these Kaima at Red Mountain, they they're staunch followers of Azura, and they even make a pledge to her that they will not mess with the heart of Lorcan. And in in breaking that oath, 
you see how how complete the punishment is it it affects more than just them it affects the entire yeah. race and it's crazy with the tribunal like doing they made a show of it because the poisoned candles and poisoned robes and, and um, such that were used to uh, kill Nerevar in one of the versions were also used to summon Azura herself and sort of like mm. just kind of give her the big middle finger. But something I wanted to bring up here, which is really good, Azura, there's a line in the book Nerevar at Red Mountain, which gives us more insight into how gods think about things because we get a little bit from um, Vivek but there is the line, what you have done here today is foul beyond measure and you will grow to regret it. For the lives of gods are not what mortals think and matters that weigh only years to mortals weigh on gods forever. Now, this is innately implying a sort of uh, existence that's outside the limitations of just linear time because it seems like an event that occurs will just weigh on them forever because they kind of seem to experience, as Vivek says in his lines that it's like being in this sort of asleep God place is like experiencing everything at once. All events are happening at mm. one time. So it's not about the linearity of it. It's just sort of like good events and bad events. It's just any it's, amount. It's of kind each. of like a blemish on the skin that you can just never get rid of. For yeah. Her at least like a permanent thing, which again is a little metaphorical thing, I guess you could say with her vanity. But the thing about Azura, which I find quite interesting is that, she seems a lot of the time kind of good intentioned, but is often betrayed, mm. you know, by, by the people that she tries to help, you know, having her star taken, potentially corrupted, you know, the Kaima who she taught all these different things to kind of like turning uh, their backs to her and, and preferring the tribunal. Um, I think there's other examples as well, yeah. which we'll probably end up talking about, but it seems like she's no doubt bitter as a result. And especially if you do look at things on a non-linear scale, like everything happening at once, it would just be this permanent bitterness that's there and this almost desperation to be adored and loved in all ways. Yeah, well, she builds a, she builds relationships of trust with the people who follow her because if, if she wants their love and admiration and she wants them to love and admire themselves, then there needs to be something more than just that kind of like, you know, business relationship or however else you want to look at it with gods and Daedra. It's, it's something more emotional. And, and you know, and, then, and another example of what you were just talking about is there's a story of a Dwemer lecturer who wanted to make a, a show to his class, basically that that the the daedra and the gods they're not completely infallible and and even though azura is right in this situation she's tricked into thinking she was wrong she was basically what happened was this duemma asked a, a close friend who was a kaima priest to to invoke azura and azura came and the, the duemma's like what's in this box and she says um she thought it was a trick and she was a little bit untrusting and then she said there's a, a rose in the box and she's right, there is. But this Dwemma pulls a little trick, a sleight of hand trick, and shows that there's nothing in there. And she she's, feels betrayed by it. So this guy then, you know, goes back to his rooms and the rose slips out of his sleeve, proving that it was there. He just wanted to trick her. And what does he get? Well, he gets killed. <laughs> you know, he dies yeah, in he his dies. sleep um, for betraying her, which is, you know, that's it, the thing is she's very willing to trust. Yeah. Th th this is such a small thing, but was it a rose? For some reason, I remember it being some other... Maybe I, it was I a do petal? remember it being a, a red flower. Okay. I, or, or a red petal or something like that. But yeah, the, the story is pretty much the same. Yeah. I just want to make sure my head cannons all lining up right. Yeah. But yeah, she, she, she does seem to, you know, be subject to almost mm -hmm. being ridiculed or just, you know, I don't know. I feel like she hasn't done that much wrong. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if you were to posit a little, like, think about it a little bit differently, it's not so much, oh, the, the Dunma turned her back on her, it's more like the tribunal turned her back on her. Yeah, for sure. And then, therefore, she cursed their entire race. And then they were like, oh my god, I'm grey, I'm red, I'm like, oh my, what's happened to us? And then the tribunal got shut up, oh, don't worry, blah, blah. You know, we're here to, to you know, you know take... um take pride in your new appearance and so on. And it's a time of new age kind of thing. But it's like, it was like, it's a pretty cruel punishment in terms of how how many people it affected outside of it. Because it was just the tribunal that... Yeah, but do, do consider that um, a lot of the Dark Elves obviously did turn their back on Azura, even though their faith <laughs> should have like happened with the Ashlanders, kept them strong believers. Yeah, but I think overall, like, I, I mean, I wouldn't be too fan of a god who just, like, you know, gave me a 
gray skin and red eyes appearance after and then the tribunal show up and say oh these old evil you know daedra did this kind of stuff to you yeah we're, i guess it just depends age. i guess it just depends how old the elf is and how much good experience they've had with the reclamations in their yeah. life so far because i think the thing with 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 her is like i said i think that i don't know if i'm going to paraphrase this quote by drew the the vanity well um mm. welfare is benevolent but um Vanity starving. Vanity is hungry spiteful. is spiteful. Yeah. Hungry is spiteful. But she is like in those examples, she kind of she you know, she's all happy to give you love and if you're in that relationship, but it's like you wouldn't want her to be your ex girlfriend because yeah, exactly. she will destroy you. She will tear down your name in front of everyone. It's that classic sort of like She has that archetype for sure. Yeah, and I think that's what that's the interesting sort of duality uh, about her. And to take it to another level, not only did you betray her and she's like an ex, you literally killed her favorite mortal. <laughs> you know, the three of them foul murdered Nerevar, who yeah. was her champion. And you know, there's the the really cool piece of artwork which I'm sure you'll put up at this point as well for the foul the murder. The foul murder. And I feel like in that sort of way, like you know how I can imagine because she has that sort of emotional investment in things, she can kind of be spiteful in that sort of in, in her rage. So her her punishments aren't measured mm. accordingly because you have like I'm not going to think about this and reason. It's a very emotional sort of how dare you? Blah blah. I don't deserve mm. this. Damn. They like you know. I feel like I'm describing some like uh, relationship sitcom kind of thing. Like yeah. you imagine like the fight, but I feel like that's what embodies her and makes her um, rage different compared to others and and a bit mm. you know. But then again, and you can almost no go on go on sorry. I was going to say, and you can almost see this kind of like obsessive need to be loved through her focus on beauty, like mm. especially in her realm. Mm. So her realm is uh, moon shadow. Yeah. And when Morian Zenus goes there, it's described as too much beauty. So Zenus gasped when he went to the next realm. I am half blind. I see flowers and waterfalls, majestic trees, a city of silver, but it is all a blur. The colors run like water. It's raining now and the wind smells like perfume. This surely is Moonshadow where Azura dwells. Mm. It's almost that vibe of like the makeup ruined in the rain on a night out and like it, the strong perfume and the crying and it's like you interesting can, too. You that, can get that vibe, right? It's interesting too that the winged twilights are her like aff affiliated sort of daedra and they're said to inhabit Moonshadow as well, because the winged twilights look kind of like fearsome kind of demon women with like wings and so on so if you sort of take that it's kind of like they're all around in moon shadow but the winged twilight's aggressive are sort of like it's kind of like symbolic of her of what can happen if she she's all beautiful and graceful and everything's wonderful but if you turn against her you're getting the winged twilight kind of thing like yeah that aggressive i'm, yeah. I'm gonna mm. shred you when she's also she can also be extremely brutal there, there's a there's an even more brutal example if we look at the kajiti myths which I'm skipping ahead, but we'll definitely talk more about all of it. But there's the example of Magrus, which is the Khajiit version of Magnus, uh, the, the sun god. But r to the Khajiit, rather than him f leaving or fleeing and tearing a, a rift in the sky, he was, um, he was punished. He, he was blinded uh, by, Bo by Boephra, which is Khajiiti Boethia, uh, and when, when he fought him and Lorcan. And... He lost an eye and then went to visit Azura and Azura considered him too cowardly to rule his own sphere. So took out the other eye, fashioned it into an ether prism and made it the sun so that it could reflect <laughs> Aetherius's, um as light down onto the, to the mortal realm. So that's pretty brutal. Mm. Yeah, she's described as cruel but wise. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess we can just start talking more about the Khajiit. I mean, you continue with, like, more so explain her role to the Khajiit. Because she's... Uh, one part of her that we should talk about, too, is that she... The whole sort of, like, dawn and dusk kind of stuff. They're two phases of change between day and night. And she is associated with a lot of things that change. She changed the forms of the... Well, she supposedly changed the, the way the Kaima could be, and that's why they became the changed ones, because mm -hmm. they could like live differently. Then she changed them into the Dunma. Then she also changed the um, base elven stock into the Khajiit, which you'll get into, but she's very... Change is a part of her sphere. Which is why she's often considered, you know, we, we mentioned it in the last podcast as well, the Erdra. So, you know, these, these original, very primordial um, entities. And 
uh, if you think about it, in so many different ways, she's fundamental because, you know, if we look at the, the interplay between Anu and Padamai, the, the god of change and the god of stasis, and you've got the, the, the ineffable light and the, you know, the darkness and the, the shadows created, and then you get linear, you get the passage of time. And if you think about the, if you, if you think about the moon and the sun passing around the sky, not only is that the passage of time, but it's also, you know, creates the shadows for mortals. And, and um, she's kind of just fundamental to pretty much every part of creation in the mortal realm mm. well and if you are also just to throw another way out there is uh with um egotism and so on but if you if you take that as more in a very basic sense of the idea of an ego a concept of the self like that kind mm. of you know what i mean it's very essential to the to the beginning of of a universe you need things to be able to recognize themselves as an individual ego Mm. Well, what are your two thoughts on the idea that she kind of can inhabit the space between the transitions as well? Like her sphere being dawn and dusk, but the in-between. The magic in between the realms of twilight is what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it is interesting because one of her artifacts, the moonlight, the moonlight blade, which is like a sickle, uh, that's in like the Kijiti stuff in the Elder Scrolls Online. But that's said to be able to pierce through like liminal barriers, mm -hmm. which which is essentially the barriers between like two things. Think of like a cup of water and like the meniscus, like that's yeah. the liminal barrier. Mm. Like that's and liminal barriers is is another term used for the lunar lattice, which is something that Azura creates in the Kajiti myths. Yes. So when I think of the the magic in between the realms of twilight, I I, I quite literally think of the magic um, in between. I, like so, it, it's mentioned that when Azura create came along to create the um, the Khajiit from these forest people, she passed between the moons. She whispered the secret words to the moons and passes through the liminal barriers. So when I think of her magic between realms of twilight, I imagine it's the magic that that you can pass through from Mundus into the into Oblivion and Aetherius and in, just outside of the mortal realm. Hmm. Yeah. It's also uh, cool when you think about what was done with Azura's star in Skyrim, how that guy basically fashioned a, a place for himself to exist inside of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I forgot his name, though. But um, it, The evil wizard. Yeah. yeah it, it's just, we all know Malin Varen, right? Yeah, something like that. Something very Which it's evil. it's very pretty it's a very pretty place when you see it the first time, but you wouldn't want to live in there for eternity, I don't think. No. No, it's a bit of a fortress of solitude, you know. It's, mm. yeah. But I think I think overall she's one of the more compelling princes compared to others because she has so many bits and pieces to her and so on. And once again, she is one of those sort of more human-oriented um, Daedra. And by that, I don't mean human opposed to elves. I mean as in mortal-oriented. Like, even just ideas that she's said to bewitch some of her followers to become, like, lovers and stuff like that. But it's that... It's all based on relationships, a love of two people and stuff that, you know, it needs to, for her realm to sort of function. So like Clavicus Vile and Barbus and some of the other gods, it kind of has that like personal element, which makes them more interesting of a character compared to, you know, some of the more basic ones like Hermaeus Mora or something. Mm. But yeah, so I, I guess start with, um, start us off with, tell us the Khajiit story. Because she, because Azura to the Khajiit is really important. She's a like, centerpiece of pretty much all of it so take it away yeah well just to you know I'll, I'll, I'll narrow it down because it's quite a long story but essentially you've got you've got Anur and Fadamai I'll probably mix up between the Khajiit words for it and the the other ones but essentially Anur and Fadamai are the are the the primordial cats who give birth to three litters and, and the third of these litters is uh was not quite so consensual Fadamai tricked Anur into impregnating her and this is when you get the mo the moons and their motions you get Nerni and you get Azura and they're the the sisters who are essentially like vying for Fadamai's favor and when she's on her deathbed she essentially gives a gift to Nerni saying you'll give birth to to the world and all the peoples on it whereas to Azura she gives her secrets and the ability to change one of these peoples into the fastest cleverest most deceptive and the best climbers and and all of this and that's how she creates the Khajiit and the, and the idea is that when she puts in place this lunar lattice which is essentially a, ver a very similar concept to the idea of you know Akatosh's barrier between Mundus and Oblivion is it's supposed to protect the mortal realm from from the gods meddling with them 
and yeah so azura is quite literally fundamental to them and 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 she she sets the moons in their motions therefore giving them the light to create their moon sugar so in every way she's at the core of their culture and that also like changes their forms with the different mm-hmm. yeah. um, positionings of the moons as well so yeah centerpiece of of, of the khajiit Mm. It, it is interesting. The Khajiit believe Azura oversees the gates of the crossing behind the lunar lattice, a twilight realm between death and the afterlife. So, so again, I don't know if you mentioned it, but it's more liminal barrier type yeah. stuff. See, and because of that role she she takes, she has so many interactions with other gods because it's it's all of these gods finding their place, and and you know you've got like Daedra, like Nocturnal, who are you know stealing the skeleton key from her supposedly, and and things like this, where Azura is kind of the centerpiece for everything, and and there's one little. Um, piece of information which i think is really cool is that there's a because Lorcage is the is the kind of the last cat given birth to by anur and fadamai it's kind of the you know the the what's the what's the word the the ugly duckling the the kind of forgotten one and and there's a point where um azura finds Lorcage with his chest torn open um and it's dripping dark his heart is dripping darkness and azura essentially extricates this darkness from his chest which is Namira and and throws it away from Lorcage, which is very similar to the idea of Auriel ripping out Lorcan's heart and creating Red Mountain. And if you think about it through that lens, you can see why Azura would have extra reason to hate the idea of her favorite mortals channeling the heart of Lorcan. You know, and, and the oath that mm-hmm. Nerevar and the and the tribunal make to her is is important for more than the reasons we already, you know, associate it with. Full yeah, circle. for sure. That's actually a good, yeah, good connection. That's that's really cool. Good, good work on that one. And <laughs> and awesome. I'll just point out, as you mentioned, like we talked about in the Nocturnal podcast, that it said Azura had her key stolen. It's just another example of someone doing something bad to Azura. Mm. You know, like Nocturnal was defeated by Boethia, which is interesting because Nocturnal's then brought before Azura to be judged. It almost sounds like you know Azura really does have quite a high position of command. Mm. It's not Boethia doing the judging, it's Azura. But before she can... She's offered to actually stay and help the Khajiit and help Azura um, or die. And instead, she just waits for that opportunity, steals a key and escapes from the realm. It's funny how in, in her... In a lot of the typical mythologies, non the, not the Khajiit one, she's sort of... The sort of vanity egotism kind of element is emphasized there's the fate and prophecy as well but but in the she's a far more benevolent sounding in the khajiit one at least in the khajiit mythology but what's interesting is she has um like the way from the the way she's spoken about i perceive it as more like there's a lot more wisdom to her and a bit more of the magic and the fate prophecy but not in a way in a way that it conveys wisdom and stuff. And I love her connection with Hamora, which is Hermaeus Mora and so on. So in the book, The Worldly Spirit, it says, Hamora records all the events he perceives and stores them away in a great library under the sea. A patient spirit, he helped Azura maintain the moons and their motions after the world was made, and Kanathi could no longer bear to do so. He is the keeper of knowledge of others, and he shares all he learns with Azura, who walks the halls of his library often. So I really like this idea. Like, imagine, like, I've never really heard that connection much, but with him being an infinite being of knowledge kind of thing, it fits mm. right in with fate and prophecy and so on. So you can imagine, like I'm imagining Azura walking through some like kind of aquatic version of Apocrypha, just like picking pages from walls and stuff. And like, No wonder she seems so smart. Like she knows what's going to happen. She's got books from the past, the future. I mean, to her, it's all the same thing, right? But yeah, exactly. She's got access to the Elder Scrolls equivalent of the internet, really. Yeah. But it, it's it's there's a, there's a lot of really cool perceptions of her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's got relationships with so many gods, and you know she's been there for a long time. She's considered an Urdra, and and being associated with prophecies is, is uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, is about as fundamental of a, a thing to be associated with as as anything. And you know the the Nerevarine prophecy that takes place during the events of Morrowind. Well, even even the nature of the Nerevian prophecy too. You know how they were, you, we've mentioned this before, but like talking about how laying out a prophecy is kind of like self fulfilling mm-hmm. prophecies, essentially, like creating them. But the Nerevarine, there was plenty of failed incarnates before the final one that actually does the trick. So it's that kind of like it's kind of even though she's it's like 
even though she's all about fate and prophecy, it's like prophecy and fate sort of undetermined. She's just going to set what she wants. Like, this is what I want to happen. And then there's even failures, but then it's like, oh, eventually Yeah, like work. she's just planted the seeds for someone to fulfill it. Yeah. And I mean, if you think about how much time passed between the promise that Nerevar would return and when Nerevar does return, it makes sense that you could have a lot of failed incarnations in that time. Yeah, it just it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you were throwing darts at a dartboard... You, you're going to get a bullseye yeah. eventually. Got some monkeys so on the top rider. It, yeah, that, it's exactly that. <laughs> it's, it's something around, I think it's something like around 3,200 years mm. that it took to actually successfully happen. She knows how to hold a grudge. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That be... plays right into the, the bitter aspect mm. of her. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, let's start talking about some of her artifacts. And I do just want to mention Moon and Star first because we're talking about Nerevar and the Nerevarine. So... This was a, it was made by Kagranak. It's a Dwemer made ring, so it's all beautiful and everything. Um, but then it's blessed by the Daedric goddess Azura. And then basically it's worn by Ner Nerevar and it's supposed to give him all of this like supernatural charm and, and, and uh, charisma. Persuasion. And persuasion. But um, funnily enough, it's like, I think it's like something like plus five personality in game. It's really weak. <laughs> but like you imagine the effect is way better than that. But um, it also, only he can wear it. If you wear it and you're not him, you'll die. And that's how you prove yourself to be the Nerevarine, is that you can successfully wear the Moon and Star ring. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's just a cool little piece. But obviously her more f you know, famous artifact is Azura's star. Mm. Well, what, just one yeah. cool thing about Moon and Star is you can imagine Kagranak has got good reason to give that to someone he's in a good relationship with. You know, it's like their their relationship is very important to... Um, amicable relations between the Dwemer and the Kaima. So giving him a ring that makes him more persuasive and, and you know, more likely to hold his his p position of power um, is a good idea if you're friends with him. Mm. It, it is, it's also quite interesting to think, and I'll, I'll put you two on the spot to see if you can think of other examples that perhaps I'm missing. But when you look at Daedric artifacts, I feel like the ones that aren't actually of Daedric origin, they all seem to be Dwemer. You've got Spellbreaker, you've got, you know, Moon and Star, which is a Dwemer artifact blessed by Azura. And then, of course, you've got Volendrang. It's just interesting that the Daedra yeah. takes such an interest. You don't see the same thing, like, here's a whole bunch of Aelid relics mm. that the Daedras, the Daedric princes have claimed, you know? Yeah, I think it's just because the Dwemer are renowned for being great craftsmen, so they want to steal their artifacts. So is Goldbrand the one said to be made by dragons? Yeah, uh, uh, there are I, some. I ironically, think, but... they're all gold and shiny, at least before they get corrupted. And you've got a couple, mm. I think, that are supposedly made by witches, and you know, like, um, like um, yeah, and... which oh, who yeah, may that's, be that's, a, a different. That's prince. a good example, but that that was literally made for Clavicus mm. Vile. Yeah, I yeah. guess was Moon and Moon and Star is made for Azura. Was, I know it was, it was made, blessed by Azura, but blessed was that by Azura the original made in... for Nerevar? Yeah. Yeah, so it was all made for him. And it was kind of like a representative thing of the Dwemer and Kaima Union, kind of. Like mm. the, the bond between Dumak and Nerevar. Mm. No, yeah. I just find it interesting considering that the Dwemer, obviously they know that the, the gods and the Daedra exist, but they don't worship them. And, and it, it's like playing hard to get. Mm. All the Daedric princes end up using their artifacts. Yeah. It's yeah, interesting. It's but anyway, let, let's talk about Azura's Star. So... As you know, this is a, a Daedric artifact that I think is pretty cool. I mean, obviously, it just looks really cool. And there's the idea that it's this unlimited capacity, reusable soul gem that's just sought after by everyone. Mages, assassins, like there's a lot of use for souls mm. in the Elder Scrolls world. So it's obviously really powerful. Um, obviously, there's the fact that this Malin Varen guy was wanting to stay alive because he was dying and could study the star and figure out a way how to put himself inside it and basically soul trap himself really there's also sorry i was saying for immortality mm. yeah yeah and also this idea that martin used it um with the ritual in oblivion to open the portal to mankar cameron's realm of paradise i know you can give him any artifact but i'm pretty sure azura's star is like the kind of canon one it's just the it's the default it's option, the default guess, one so. that he uh, doesn't he ask you to get it it's usually it's the it's usually the default one, I think, just because it's like if you haven't got any or something, default one. It's is, and it's a level two quest. To get. Yeah, it's a level two quest. It just starts. And, 
And then, of course, in Morrowind, it's used to hold the souls of the living gods, Vivek and Alexia. Well, that's if you kill them. If but, you kill them, but it can. It can, mm. yeah. It, like, that's and, how and that's unlimited the, the capacity is. But that's interesting, too, because because Oblivion introduced... I'm pretty sure it was Oblivion that introduced the concept of black soul gems. So, you can't, like... If Azura Star can't capture a mortal soul, how is it going to capture a god soul or something? And then, you know, it's got to become a black star first. Yeah, but, right. But this okay. is this is just gameplay mechanics. The way I like to see the Azura Star is a bit more just, it's mm. a super-powered um, soul gem. Like, you know what I mean? And in Morrowind, it did, you can use it to, I'm pretty sure, capture the souls of greater beings than just a, just like a creature or something. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. and then what else is there well yeah that simply the fact that you can you can have it corrupted into the black star is also a good parallel to you know the relationship we're talking about with uh, azura and you know being betrayed you know you can actually get something better out of it but um we made a recent a recent video basically saying in a law perspective betraying her is probably worse than getting a slightly better <laughs> artifact because you know what can mm -hmm. happen to you yeah, yeah so sure. it's, it's interesting too in the high elf that um because in that getting the black star in that quest is kind of thrown to you as sort of the moral thing to do by the high elf uh is it it's i can't remember if it's nelkar Nelka. Nelka, something like that he kind of says like oh the daedra are evil they they like do all these evil things just i don't give it back to her don't she she shouldn't have it kind of thing and uh, you know risky move but he sort of like you know traditional sort of elven kind of view mm. of things it's the ultimate risky move for him because he doesn't even stand to benefit from keeping the black star you know at least you betrayed azura to get something he just betrayed her for nothing yeah or maybe just for the experience of it all uh, i find it also funny it's just a little moral in fact but the gold value of azura's star is equal to five thousand times the point value of the soul so azura's star combined with a large soul the it makes it the largest value item in the game. The largest soul is fifteen hundred points, giving a maximum value of seven million five hundred thousand gold. <laughs> That's a lot of money. So, uh, just to add another little tid that, like a little tad of info there about her dagger four quest, because. She's basically just charged, like, so Agent of the Blades, that's the main character, or whoever you play. But basically, she sent someone to kill a monk who had offended her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, she's not all, like, as much as there's a benevolence to her, she really is, like, sometimes that's an example of, like, it's fairly petty. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, her, she is, she is petty. It's like, if you're going to follow her, you have to stay on a good side, or you're gonna get screwed like you can't you can't like sort of you can't leave on good terms you can't be like mm, this was an amicable breakup like you can't just you know it's... you have to simp forever once you're in yeah pretty much <laughs> pretty much she is the queen of simps like it's quite literally her domain like everyone just simp for her <laughs> you know <laughs> i feel like that's the better one i mean there's there are some dirty jokes here rim of all holes is a legitimate name she's associated with like that's do you know what it's from it's from the first pocket guide so if you type in the first um pocket guide to the empire like the actual like title thing it has like you know to akatosh to kenareth and everything on one way and then it has the 16 acceptable blasphemies and it's written backwards mm. but it's just to azura the rim of all holes <laughs> and oh, there you go do you know what the rim of a hole is ladies and gentlemen i'll tell you it's a liminal barrier well there you go <laughs> oh, also okay, kind of yeah. sounds like an anus too but, <laughs> yeah. <know>. <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know but then she's also like you know supposed to be a daedra of beauty and such so you know <laughs> so <laughs> what maybe there's <laughs> differing opinions yeah <laughs> so what yeah you know to uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that adds the another anus definition to moon, doesn't it? <laughs> what moon are we referring to? I love how this is to generate from all this, like, you know, talk of prophecy and magic and mystery and all, oh, she changes and she's so important. She's changed all these races. She's so important to everything. And then it turns into Daedra of simps and anuses. <laughs> <laughs> There's also, there is also the Ring of Azura. We we but just yeah. finished talking about that, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm kidding. Ring. It's the rim of Azura. No, yeah, but ring no, no. is also the rim? a word for. It. Okay, what am I doing? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah. yeah. The ring of Azura. Compose yourself, <laughs> gentlemen. The mm -hmm. ring of Azura is kind of underwhelming. It yeah. gives Night Eye 
for 20 points on self and restore fatigue three points on self uh yeah. the Nerevar- the Nerevarine receives it from azura at the conclusion of the main quest kind cool. of a little you know shitty gift for such a big effort <laughs> like, yeah i know i know it's like i mean yeah. it's the journey not the destination scott you know i don't know how much the Nerevarine enjoyed it like because there's a lot of like danger it's it's not about it's not about enjoyment it's not just a hedonistic journey you know it's a fulfilling journey Mm, yeah like penance and well you get it for killing (laughs) dagoth right so um i wonder what your gift would have been if you just listened to him and sided with him well he i mean i don't know dagoth kind of wants well he thinks everything is him so i guess look we're not going to go on a day off, though. That's another episode. Yeah, that's another episode. 100%. But I, th- I th- think that wraps up everything in Zura, unless you guys have any other extra insights. Not really. I feel like the only thing you'd talk more, you'd just be going all over Morrowind's history, which mm. yeah, is like, not really needed. Because really, there's not much to it asa- outside of that essential, like, kind of... A lot of the intricacies and stuff come from the varying accounts of Red Mountain and so on. But I do find that that both with Vivek and her quote, the idea that all events happen at once, like it's kind of a, if you, if you were to think about it in a different way, you might, you can't kind of have something happen to you and go, oh, well, you know, the past is in the past because the past is the now and the future and everything's all at once. So a slight against her can't be forgotten. So in a way, holding a grudge can be seen through a different lens because if you perceive mm. it as it's always happening to her because time is always being experienced all events at once so there is no oh, past and past you, you slided me back then it's like a it's a constant thing almost for it's kind of like a if someone put a knife in your side and just left it there if, mm. if if you're if you're immortal but it still hurts so you'll live forever but you just have this knife in your side you're hardly holding a grudge for being angry are you <laughs> Because someone put a knife there and it hurts. Yeah, 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 you know? exactly. So, so in a way, her her vanity or or um, is kind of it, it's a bit more warranted in the in that her sense. Her bitterness, it, yeah. her bitterness. Sorry to to um and her lashing out because of the way it affects her. Though through a mortal lens, you can't really comprehend how bad this thing. You know, oh, mm. I just quick, I just stole her artifact. It's you know, oh no, biggie. She's a big powerful Daedra, but that event is like. Weighing on forever. It's another way to, to you know, give her a little bit of more, you know. But but I feel like all Daedric princes are like that. It just becomes more of an important thing when you're trying to talk about a Daedric prince that's often perceived as good. As good. And, yeah. 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 Mm. All right, I'm done simping for her and trying to like, you yep. know, stick up for her. She she is really mean. Well, it's funny how much Azura <laughs> loves, um, you know, like being loyal and and showing your love and affection, and then you've got. Mafala, the other good Daedra, who's teaching all these Kaima to assassinate each other and betray each other and all of this. It's a, you know... It's... Yeah, she seems quite nice by comparison, mm. doesn't she? And just to throw another little link out there, but the Khajiit and uh, Dunham mythologies in ways are kind of linked. Like the, the Azura Mafala um, Boethia trio mm-hmm. um, are seen together in both of those versions. Azura is much more prominent in the Khajiit one, but they are, they are like, they do hang out together. Mm. You know, Boethia and Mephala and Azura in various good. stories. Hmm. Yeah. Good friends. Yeah. But that- anyway, I think that wraps up the podcast. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks everyone for watching. The liminal it's- bridge of the podcast. It- it's uh, It's been a lot of fun. Uh, I guess social media links are in the description. Mm-hmm. We look forward to nerding out with you all again. <laughs>